nerdlings! This week we're taking a short break from the editing tips series to tackle a subject that one of my viewers, True Heart Design, suggested and that is description. Writing description seems to be one of those things that some writers trip up on and other ones just take off into the wild blue yonder and describe everything that they can get their pencil on. So I happen to be one of those writers who falls into the latter category. I love to describe everything. I want every adjective that exists and I want to use them all. This is not a good idea, folks. Don't do that. So over the years, I've had to learn how to dial it back, when to dial it back, and really focus in on why description is important, how it should work, and when you should use it. And that is what we are talking about today. So before we can really nail down the who, what, when, where, and why of description, we need to know what it is. Basically, in writing, description is just the process of putting an image into the reader's mind. Now, every reader is going to have something of a mental image going on just by default, because that's the way that we think. So even if you just said, a cat walked down the road, the reader is going to picture a cat walking down the road. In my mind, I immediately see an orange tabby. I don't know why, that just happens to be my default. And every reader will probably have a picture that somehow relates to their own personal experiences. Maybe they grew up with um, a beautiful Russian blue cat. And so when you say a cat walked down the road, that's the mental picture they have. So that is gonna be there by default. And what we're using description to do is alter that mental image to suit what you are trying to get across as the writer. So that's how you decide to include you know, if the cat was large or small, what color the fur was, what color its eyes were, did it look healthy, was it a sickly cat? All of those things go into your decision-making process as a writer. Those are the things, descriptions, that help you control the mental image that the reader gets in their head. Why do writers use description? For the purposes of this video and big overarching themes, we're gonna look at four main reasons. And the first reason is to set the scene. Setting the scene is basically just letting the reader know when and where something happened. This could go very far into detail or it could be very bare bones. That completely depends on why you are setting the scene, what the reader should understand about the scene, what's going to happen there. Is this a very pivotal kind of a place or is it just something that happens in passing? Those things will kind of inform what you decide to include in the description but by default, it does not require a large amount of description. The second reason for description in your writing is to immerse the reader. Now, this does require a bit more information. That doesn't necessarily mean that immersing the reader requires a huge amount of description. Um, it, in general, is going to require a bit more than a simple setting of the scene, but the trick here is to include the right description. The whole idea of immersing the reader is just to draw them into the scene and let them experience what the characters are experiencing. The next reason for including description is to give the reader clues about the point of view character. What the point of view character chooses to describe in a scene and how they describe those things gives the reader clues as to who that point of view character is as a person. And the final reason for including description, at least as far as this video goes, is to tell the reader that something is important. Detail is basically a signal to the reader that they should be paying attention to something. So if Sandra walks into a room and she notices that there are blue curtains and they're made of silk and they blow in the breeze and they make the room feel light and airy and they remind her of the blue curtains of her childhood, then you're telling the reader that there's something significant about these curtains, whether that it's because they remind her of her childhood bedroom or what, these curtains exist and this description exists in order to let the reader know that there's something important about what's happening right now. Um, on the other side of that coin, you can include detail sometimes to throw your reader off. So if you're in a descriptive scene and you have a little bit of foreshadowing going on, but you want to make sure that the reader doesn't pay too much attention to the foreshadowing, you may decide 
to add some description to other parts of the scene to draw the reader's attention away from that tricky little part that you want to pop back into their head later on, but you don't want to give them too many clues that it's important. So you may choose to withhold description from that particular subject and let it kind of pass a little bit under the radar while including a little bit more description in something else that's happening in the scene in order to distract the reader from that little foreshadowing. So that both sides of that coin, um, the reader will see that detail means something is significant. So you can can either use this to your advantage or the reader's disadvantage. So setting the scene, immersing the reader, giving the reader clues about the point of view character, and allowing the reader to recognize when a detail is important are all great reasons to include description in your writing. Now we know what description is and what it effectively does, when do we use it? Quite simply, we just use description when it's important for the reader to have a very clear picture in their mind of what a place, a person, or a scene looks like. When you're writing and you're trying to figure out whether or not you should include additional description somewhere, ask yourself, is it important for the reader to know blank? The building was white, the curtains were blue, the cat was orange. Um, did the kick go at a 90 degree angle? Was it the left leg or the right leg? Uh, what was the sound in the room? All those little details that include or affect, excuse me, that affect the way that the picture is built in the reader's mind. Is it important for those things to be known? If it is, then you need to include some description. If it's not, then you can allow the reader's mind to basically come up with that mental image on their own. Like I said before, Readers are going to include some part of mental imagery on their own. What's important about description is that it lets you give the details of that mental image. So you get to decide what color the cat is, which way it was walking, if it was limping or not. That's when you need to include those descriptions. If your picture that you're trying to paint is more important than the reader's default mental image, that's where description goes. Once you know you need to add some description, What's the goal of that description? How do you know what to include when you're describing something? Keep in mind, all of this can be expanded upon, but for the purpose of this video, we're going to keep things fairly broad and not too detailed, um, just so we can make sure we can fit it all in an amount of time that you actually have to pay attention to a video in the day. So if you're trying to set the scene, what is the amount of detail that you need to include? This is how I would choose. If you're setting the scene, choose what's important for the reader to know. If you're writing a connecting scene and your character happens to be passing through a busy city, if this is just one of those scenes that helps people get from point A to point B, then you might need to only include something simple like the fact that the height of the buildings blocked out the skyline and it was filled with the noise of people. Or maybe you could just say a simple, they, you know, had to squeeze through the press of pedestrians on the street and, you know, shout to be heard over the sound of traffic. Um, just a couple of simple little details that give people the idea of a busy city. But if it's not a pivotal place or if the city does not become an important scene or character, then you don't necessarily need to include all of that extra description that would really immerse the reader in the situation, particularly if you want the reader to be paying closer attention to something like the dialogue or uh, what characters are doing specifically that is moving the plot along but doesn't necessarily make the city important to that scenario, then a couple of simple descriptions is probably enough to let your reader, who chances are have their own ideas about what big cities look like, build those pictures in their head and those will be completely suitable for your purposes. But if the scene is important, if the city itself is important, if the setting is really important to the mood or the character development, the plot, um, sometimes settings become characters almost in writing. And in those circumstances, then you do want to start giving the description a little more life. You might mention that, you know, the alley smelled like stale beer and cigarette butts, or that the, um, you know, the pigeons were, you know, playing 
chicken with the taxis or just those little things um, that really bring a scene to additional life that help immerse the reader. If the point is not just to set the scene but to immerse the reader, that's when those additional descriptions come in handy. Another thing to pay attention to when you're trying to decide how much description to lay on a scene is how should the reader feel about this person, location, or event. The words you choose and the subjects that you use to describe and the words that you choose to describe them are going to give the readers subtle clues about how you want them to react to a scene or a person or an event or an action. Whatever you're describing, those details, if you were to call a stray dog a cur, then that immediately lets the reader know that this is not a desirable kind of animal. If you were to say lost puppy, then those words completely change the mental image. So that is one of those tricky little ways that you can influence how the reader feels about something in your description. And finally, when you're using description to set a scene, the other thing you need to ask yourself is how does the point of view character feel about this situation, person, event, etc. You might have a character who loves the life and the ebb and flow of the big city and so the way that they describe that city is going to be completely different than somebody who likes peace and quiet and doesn't like to be surrounded by too many people. Those descriptions will give the reader clues to who that character is and how they feel and think about the things they're experiencing. My main character in the Eververse Chronicles, Allie, is a food lover. She really loves good food and so often when she's in a setting, if there is food around, chances are she's going to notice the smell of it, she's going to describe it, and you're going to see um, something having to do with her eating a food, whether that's something from a street vendor or actually sitting down to dinner somewhere. Um, that's one of those things that is just a character quirk of hers. She really, really loves good food. So that is one thing I use when she is a point of view character to let people know that little clue about who she is. And just, I reinforce that every now and then because not only does it often give clues to the setting as of what kind of food she's eating and how she feels about that food. So you get the idea a little bit of who she is through those simple descriptions. Okay, immersion, this is the big one. This is the one that can be the trickiest to pull off because it does require a little bit more in the way of description, but it also tends to fall prey to over description. So let's talk about how we figure out how to describe a scene, a person, etc., in order to immerse the reader. Immersion goes beyond simply setting the scene, which could be something as simple as saying the empty hallway or the grassy field. This is when you're going to start adding sensory information into your description in order to help the reader feel like they're experiencing things along with the character. Usually you want to include two, but preferably three different. For immersion, usually you want to include two, but preferably three different senses. And if you can swing in a fourth and do it well, then you can include a fourth as well. Going with all five may be a bit heavy handed and is not going to fit in every circumstance. So be careful of trying to include everything, but choose the senses that are the most pertinent to that situation and try to include those in your description. You've got sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch, and not every situation is going to be suitable to include things like taste, so you have to probably be careful with that one more than anything else, but most scenarios will at least give you two comfortably, three is great, and then if you can squeeze in that fourth, like I said before, do it well, then that is really going to contribute to immersing the reader in what's going on. But how do you do it? How? How? Tell me how to do it. Descriptive language. This is where the actual meat and bones of description happens. So you're going to let the reader know where something is at. So the size, the location, the texture, the shape of something, the color of it, the smell of it, how it feels on the skin, um, you know, the sounds that it makes. And, and that's um, really something that you can apply all across the board. Um, even to as far as, you know, let's say you're a description and there's an animal in the scene. They may have a smell if they rub up against you. They're gonna have a feeling. Um, they might be making some kind of a noise. A city is the same thing. All of these different senses. So you can describe um, 
how, you know, the book felt and smelled in the hand or how the chair creaked underneath you and was solid and held your weight. Um, it, but once you do that, you have to keep in mind that you're wanting to only include the things that are important. We don't need to include every single detail. So the trick here is when you're choosing what to describe and how to describe it is not to use every word. Don't grab every adjective and every adverb you can get your hands on, but choose the right ones, the ones that are pertinent to, you know, what you want the reader to feel, the way that the character, the point of view character feels about where they're at. Um, and what you want the mental image to be. This doesn't always require a huge amount of description. Sometimes you can use, this doesn't always require a huge amount of description. Sometimes you can choose a couple of representative details that will be universal enough to get the point across to the reader so that their mental mind image factory kind of takes over for you. Let's look at an example real quick. In my first book, The Laws of Founding, Fairly early on in the book, my main character, Allie, ends up in a diner with the man who's going to be training her to use her abilities. And it's one of those diners that many of us have been in before. So this is how I described it. The carpet in the diner looked older than me and was still riddled with cigarette burns from the days before it became a no-no to smoke in public. I scrunched my nose and slid warily across the pocked leather of the booth seat opposite Ronan. I didn't bother to hide my disdain. Are you hungry or not? I looked up from the table where Jenny is a slut was scratched into the plastic surface in rude block lettering. The grimace on my face must have given me away. So several things are happening in this description. I've only included really just a couple of main descriptors. One, that the carpet was old and had cigarette burns in it. And two, that the plastic top of the table had some graffiti scratched into it. Now, this is not the kind of thing that happens or lasts long in upscale joints. So you have a good idea of this establishment pretty quickly. And many of us have been in a cafe like that, that is just old as the hills and has been around forever. And teenagers have come in and people have kind of just treated this place like junk, but it still remains standing. For some reason, people still go there. Those are real places. And so just choosing those couple of descriptors, those couple of representative details allows me to kind of get the picture across and let the reader's mind take over. I don't need to go into the color of the carpet or the size of the windows or what, you know, color the leather was or anything like that. Um, those two simple things give enough to the reader to allow them to continue setting the scene by themselves. It also gives us a really good clue about how our point of view character feels about places like this, particularly about eating in places like this. It is no accident that she chose those details to communicate to the reader. Now, if this had been a very pivotal scene or if this cafe was a very important place and I really needed to immerse the reader in what was happening and let them experience this cafe for themselves, then I might have included other things like the smell of rancid cooking oil or the sound of clinking forks on plastic plates. Um, you know, those are additional little sensory details that I could have added if I had felt that this scene was important enough or this place was important enough to warrant that kind of description. But those couple of representative details were enough to allow the reader to paint a picture without me having to add 20, 30 additional words to the word count of the book. When the description needs to be larger in scope, that's when you're gonna to have to include additional details in your description. In this example from my second book, The Founding Lie, the characters have just got to a city that they've never been to before. All right, this one's a little bit longer, so prepare yourself. Trying to ignore the reek of undisguised body odor, I shoved my way through the press of humanity at the docks and didn't stop until my feet were on solid stone. I took a few wobbly kneed steps backward to sag onto one of the benches that lined the stone walkway abutting the docks. Two days on the water with little sleep and less food had left me shaking like a leaf in autumn, clinging to a branch while knowing I was about to fall anyway. It's over, I told myself. You're on solid ground, let it go. With a concerted effort of will, I looked up. Rich slid between passing workmen with the deft skill of a thief, drawing no notice and never so much as brushing someone's sleeve unless he meant to. 
He looked surprisingly comfortable aside from the occasional twitch of his hand toward his right ear, which was covering the slim translator. Quite a place, eh? He said, after sitting next to me on the bench. It looks like a few different cities squished into one. Gonna have a hell of a time trying to find that museum. I nodded and shaded my eyes to peer at the city rising before us. An unlikely conglomeration of old and new, Wodenstadt had a charm that spoke of long years and rich history. The narrow brick buildings that were built row upon row close to the waterfront had once been painted in vivid, irresponsible hues, but had aged into more sedate shades. Ronan had told us that this part of Yorth had much the same yearly schedule as the Northern Hemisphere in most verses, where the summer saw long hours of daylight and the winter barely any sun. I could understand why brightly colored buildings would be desirable during 20 hour long nights. So, I have a couple blocks where it's just pure description. I have some description that is disguised as um, talking and watching other things happen, like other characters. And I have some that are, um, you know, the, the character's physical reaction to things that have happened. So through this, we know that um, they have been on a boat, that they are at a dock now, that there are a lot of people because one of the character, um, one of the characters has had to kind of, you know, slide between people and the other one is actually pressing through people to get away from the dock, that there's the smell of, you know, body sweat in the air because of the workmen that are passing. Um, we know kind of in general what city we're looking at, where there are older buildings with newer buildings. Some are brick. They've been painted bright colors that have started to decay a little bit. Um, all of those kinds of things are happening as the character is experiencing them rather than just in big blocks. So this helps the description to feel a little bit more natural, like it's part of the narrative rather than just here's what the city they were in looked like, which is definitely how I prefer to approach description in general, rather than, you know, giving a big block of description and then these are the things that happened. Um, it's best if I can kind of integrate that into the narrative and allow um, whatever is being described, whether it's a person or a place or an event, um, to come to life as the character experiences it. Now, the main part of what True Heart Designs asked in the comment was how much is too much description and how much is not enough. And honestly, without looking at context, there really is no way to say. But as just a very general rule, if you have large paragraphs, just big blocks of text that are nothing but description, there's a really good chance you've taken it too far. Remember to ask yourself, what is the point of this description? Is this something the reader really needs to know? And whether or not this advances the story. Does it give clues to the reader about the character, about the story, about the setting, hints about the future? In short, the description needs to play some kind of a role in the story rather than just making the reader see a picture. There's very little chance that the exact size, shape, dimensions of my water bottle are going to be important to anybody. This also goes for character actions. So you do not need to describe every single action a character takes when they are doing something. All of us do things. We have a really great mental faculty that will allow us to fill in the blanks. So if the character is making tea, we don't need to give every single detail of the action. We don't need to say, Tony reached up to open the cabinet and pulled out a mug and then closed the cabinet, setting his mug down on the counter. He walked to the sink and turned on the water and slid the pot underneath the water, then put the lid back on and turned the water off. He walked to the stove and said, you see where I'm going with this? We don't need every detail. You can include just a couple of actions to let us know that the reader, or excuse me, that the character is doing something and we as readers can fill in those blanks for ourselves. But, if something is particular, or if you are using something as I did with the diner where it is kind of an example that allows the reader to build the rest of the picture in their mind, that's a great detail to include. Brandon Sanderson does this really beautifully in his Stormlight Archive. It's an incredibly unique world where 
the uh, flora and fauna and even the weather are completely um, different than what we experience here on Earth. But rather than explain everything and give us all of these details in his descriptions, he just throws off little one-liners that give you clues that something is different here. When he mentions grass pulling back into the rock buds, he doesn't go into a big description of the rock buds and the color of the grass and why it behaves this way. He basically just allows it to happen in the context of the story. And that detail, that little tiny bit of description allows the reader to continue to build that picture in their mind to make guesses about why. And then the longer you're in the world, the more you see why these plants behave the way they do because there are huge storms that roll through and so they've developed this property of self-protection by pulling within these little rock buds. Um, those kind of descriptions work really, really well because they're not beating the reader over the head with every adjective and adverb to describe the things that you're seeing. They're giving the reader just the right amount of detail that they can continue to build that picture. I know not everybody is going to agree with me on this, but I firmly believe that you should not pull the reins completely out of the reader's hands, that you should not build a scene or a location or a character or whatever else so absolutely completely that the reader has no job left to do. Readers want to work a little bit for what they're given. We need to allow the reader to participate in the story enough that they are also creating images in their head. If not, then it's kind of infantilizing the reader. It's like you're not trusting them to come with you on this journey. You're trying to spoon feed them um, almost as if your mental images are more important than their imagination. And the truth is that it takes both of those things in order to make a story work. Your reader has to bring their imagination to the story because if they don't, they're not participating, which means they won't be invested. And it means that they're not going to be able to identify with the story and character as deeply as they could if they were allowed to bring their own experiences to the story. So don't overdo it, choose the right things to describe and the right words to describe them and trust your reader that they will be able to catch on to where you're going and follow you on that journey. Woo, okay, that was a long one, but I'm hoping that it was really helpful. If you thought it was, then please subscribe, like this video, let me know down in the comments if there was anything I missed, if there's things that you think about descriptions that you want to share, um, if there's anything that you would love to see me cover in another video, definitely let me know. I'm also going to be opening up my Patreon soon so that my patrons can suggest videos. So that's definitely a place to look if you would like to have a little bit more control over what content comes out. The founding lie is in proof mode. Woo! I mean, it worked for like, it's been a year, guys. This has been, um, it's been a year of writing and editing and all that kind of stuff. And now I'm finally have my proof copies um, and arcs are out and I'm just going through making sure that the formatting is beautiful and everything looks fantastic um, so that these finals can be in. So the exciting things are gonna happen now because this is so close to releasing. Um, some fun stuff is gonna start happening. We're gonna, I'm gonna run some giveaways. There's gonna be some contests for um, cool, cool bookish goodies. So be paying attention for that. Hit the, um, the little bell if you want to make sure that you get notified because um, you never know when a giveaway might happen. So be paying attention for that. Finally, thank you so much for spending your time with me. I hope it was worth it. Until next week. Be wonderful.